It's got big buttons, no functionality. Um, YouTube Live is, uh, yes, um, so, uh, and like, for example, we have access to it because we've got to do notifications, emails, stuff, stuff. And we got access to it about, about six months ago, I guess. Um, so, but it's rolling out eventually everybody with yeah. Gmail I'm not sure where they're going. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.
Second of this symposium. Thank you very much for, for sticking around. I'm Mark Larson. Worked with Ronstadt and Andrew and others to put this all together. We've got some exciting uh, concluding materials for you, starting with Tanina Ronstadt from uh, uh, Georgetown, who's going to follow up on what Roger told us about activities there. And then we'll hear from Oliver Goodenough from Vermont, and Will Hornstein from the ABA. And finally, I'm going to talk a bit about one very minor issue, which is. Is any of the stuff we're doing legal? <laughs> <laughs> so let me turn it over to Tanina, who's going to uh, okay. start us off. Okay, so Roger Scalbeck, our digital librarian. Uh, Kevin Mulcahy, uh, who's the, the education director at a platform that we've used a lot, Near the Logic, which is a similar platform to A2J in the sense that it, it, it's for building legal access systems. Paper today is thinking like a lawyer, designing like an architect, which is also uh, in the uh, law review. We've been very fortunate, as you know, from Roger, we've been doing this. We got a head start, uh, uh, and very lucky, as others have, all, of course. Uh, and what I want to talk about today, I'm sh I, I think uh, a lot of people think about this in terms of access to justice, but I want to talk about this in terms of uh, the pedagogic values of building apps, OK? And there are going to be four points. Point number one, that you teach students how to design. Uh, the three other, five points maybe, three other points is how in different ways this, this type of exercise actually fits in with traditional pedagogy that we want to do, or uh, law schools have done, so we're not doing something totally and completely different. And the, and the fourth point is actually thinking about lawyers. It follows up on the first one, which is that lawyers, we now have to start thinking about them as systems architects, systems designers. Okay. Uh, so uh, just, I don't know uh, if Roger talked about this, but last year a, uh, we, we did a demo app called Same Sex uh, Marriage Advisor. And I apologize, the screenshot sucks, but this is what you see the first screen, uh, Same Sex Marriage Advisor, students built by three students. Um, and it asked, it was meant for 50 states, it's built for 50 states, and it was built so that same sex people who want to engage in same, uh, have a same sex marriage could figure out not only could they get married, but all the implications of getting married, like uh, inheritance, uh, federal taxes, which is not good, et cetera. So they built that uh, last year. And uh, what this particular system does is it gives you, at the very end, gives, gives the user a whole bunch of guidance about what they know, and so this is just one example of what they, what, excuse me, what the app 
can tell them based on the information that they uh, uh, that they uh, inputted. Uh, so this is one example. Because you live in New York, you and your partner can get married and receive the same benefits that heterosexual married couples in New York receive, including hospital visitation rights, automatic inheritance, and joint state tax rights. So that's what the user, who's already said they live in New York and identified a series of things that the user cares about, gets to see at the end, and some of it more detail. Uh, it comes in an email, they can see it in the app, et cetera. So uh, another app uh, that we, oh, okay, so let me start with the first point. Uh, oops, that's not the first point. This is uh, the, uh, the first point I want to make is the idea that uh, students uh, become systems designers, and they have to think differently about, uh, rather than case-by-case -case method, case-by-case uh, -case analysis, they have to think about systems and they have one of the things that we've focused on and we don't have it right yet, but uh, having students build, uh, sys uh, design documents, right? And our view is, and Roger probably said this, I apologize, uh, that it's not about the platform, it's about the system. And so that ultimately the platforms could be completely different in 15 years, but having students learn how to design systems is what's important here. So. Um, uh, one of the apps we built this year that's going to go live uh, in, uh, I can't remember the state, bankruptcy right for you, uh, actually it's going to go live with, uh, uh, in D.C. Uh, um, uh, on Pro Bono Net, uh, is bankruptcy right for you. And so this is also, apologize for the quality, um, it's rough morning. Uh, 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 this is, you, you get to see the students have to think about schematically, they have to think in terms of, flow charts and spreadsheet things. These, this is very simple. Uh, so this is the beginning of their app. Are you over 18? If you say no, it kicks you out. Are you a DC resident? No, it kicks you out. Obviously, that's the, sim the very simple first step. It gets much more complicated, but then the slide will look even worse. OK, uh, so that's point number one. They learn how to design systems. They also learn how to do learn foundational legal skills. First one is they learn to read law, right? I mean, that's sort of basic. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but they learn to read law. They need to figure out what some of the vague things mean uh, in uh, when they're applied, et cetera. Okay? They also learn, so that's legal analysis. Uh, then they learn a couple of skills that's con that are connected with what we think is traditionally as clinical education. Okay? And so that's why I think this, uh, this makes sense that all of the, you, many of you are clinicians, that this makes sense for this to be in the clinical space. Uh, and that is, um, they have to imagine the user's world. They have to imagine this domain of issues that may come up. Going back to uh, the, um, the same-sex marriage advisor, in that case, you have to think not just uh, about do they have a legal right, but you have to think, well, in some states, you have, when a, a, a marriage is filed in court. So the, if it's a couple who wants, does want to be out, then they should know about that, right? They need to know about that. In bankruptcy, for some people, they, they don't want to file for bankruptcy. There's an implication for certain kind of jobs or certain uh, some of their property. And so students have to imagine the realm, the domain of problems that come up uh, for potential users. So that's uh, one way. And they also, the other point that I want to make that's also fundamentally about clinical teaching, and the way I do it is a little bit of a joke, um, but. Uh, as you think about what students learn in law school, they learn, and we, I was a clinician for five years before I became a traditional stand-up bad comedian, uh, AKA a traditional law professor. Um, uh, the, uh, when you spend a lot of time in clinics, right, is teaching students how to talk to clients in English, right, as opposed to legalese, uh, as opposed to um, using words like court or like uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, I can't even think of them because I don't remember them. But you get the idea, right? That you have to teach them how to uh, talk in English and communicate in English, and that's what building apps like these is about, right? They have to actually think very hard about the user and whether the user is going to understand what they're saying, right? So, so to understand what the app is doing, and they have to do it even more. You know, when you're when you're representing somebody on a one-to-one -one basis, you can see. From talking to them. How much time do I have? Uh, two minutes. Two minutes, okay. Uh, you can see, uh, it's perfect, I'm going to be under. Uh, you can see, uh, when you're talking to someone face to face, right, you can see if they understand what you're talking to. And lawyers, you know, and that's actually what 
teaching clinics, right, is to communicate and to sort of pick up the signals and to sort of work hard at communicating. Well, it's even, this is, makes it an even harder exercise, right? Because they've got to imagine the user. They've got, they can't just sort of use the body language and the tones and all the things we do to pick up on understanding whether we're being effective communicators, right? You have, they have to sort of talk in English and they have to do it from the beginning. Uh, so some of the apps that we built, we actually built one app uh, this year, and I'm sorry not to have the, the, uh, par the uh, uh, a, um, a, uh, uh, an illustration of it that I, lo I would have loved for you to see, but it's for persons with disabilities, uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, mental disabilities, and so the, the users, the, excuse me, the builders of the app ended up uh, incorporating all sorts of visual, visual things so that not only could someone read, try to read what was going on, but also see what the options were to reinforce that, right? Uh, and that was, uh, so that's the exercise here with the app. You know, we, we, uh, we, most of our apps, we expect a ninth grade uh, reading level, right? That's not how lawyers read. So that's my English as a second language uh, point. So the last point I want to make uh, was that uh, we have to think much more, and this is going on not just in the individual representation world, which I know you've been talking about and which we'll continue to talk about, which is really important. It's also ha happening in the corporate world in which corporations are sick and tired, as many of us have heard again and again, of having lawyers charge them on a case-by-case -case basis and saying, well, we use the hourly fee, why? Because we couldn't possibly tell you how much, the, what this representation is, uh, uh, how much it, it, it's really worth, right? And, and corporate clients are sick of that, and they, they themselves, they work in corporations where there are systems. If you think about the corporate world, it's as systematic as it comes, right? It's all about process and system. So what we need to do as law teachers is think about uh, a, 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 a different kind of way of thinking about what it means to practice law without the, should whether it's really practice law or not, but to think about them, we'll hear about that later, but to think about them as uh, thinking about architecture and design, and that means both in terms of the systems and what's below the hood, but also means design connected with the sensibility that's now uh, very much our shared sensibility as a, as a culture, as a society, as a world, which I think of and we all think of as the iTunes sensibility, right, because iTunes, I mean, I, excuse me, Apple sensibility, because Apple is the one that has kind of shaped our, it has to look good, it has to be beautiful, it has to be interactive, right? So there are, and there, and there are all sorts of design principles from that world that, it's, that we can, and it's really fun to learn and incorporate into doing this, because you need to make it uh, a communicate, not just in terms of words, but in terms of you working on the screen, right? Which is different from words, et cetera. So, I don't think of these us as being, uh, this is teaching legal engineering. I think of this as design and architecture because there are aesthetic values here. And uh, that's what our, our students, and this is where our students are gonna go. And we should all seize this as an opportunity to get them there because uh, so we're gonna blow up the legal profession. As uh, I think um, Richard, who left already, Richard Granite said, that, or it's blowing itself up. Let's create lawyers who are designers and architects. Okay. Sorry. Thank you, Tanita. And, and speaking of aesthetics and, and beauty and, and design, if you haven't yet visited the, the site that's the materials for the higher tech lawyer competition, which are cached and available to watch yes. after yep. afterwards, yep. take a moment because it'll give you a sense of, of the, the spin you can put upon a course like this and, and the publicity you can generate, the enthusiasm you can create for students to stand up in front, to present, to and all this stuff is there for posterity. However, it's going to take us a little more deeply. Next year. Next year. <laughs> However, it's going to take us more deeply into kind of the jurisprudential and, and pedagogical aspirations behind these kinds of courses. Thanks very much. Um, I want to just uh, first of all uh, second what you were hearing just a minute ago. Our, our, one of my students in, in, in our class, uh, introductory class on e-lawyering, uh, at one point as they, they were working on a project to, to systematize and automate an area of law, said, "I wish I'd, I'd learned torts this way." Because once once they're once they're actually uh, 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 making that kind of architecture, uh, so much comes clear to them. Anyway, I'm going to talk a little bit about developing an e-curriculum, where, what, and how. This is a bit of a summary of, of what you've seen in the uh, uh, what you will see if you take a look at it in the article that I've got in this. Uh, uh, first of all, a disclaimer: I'm going to mention uh, briefly some stuff I'm working on in, in the uh, Office of Financial uh, uh, Research at the Treasury. They're not their views. Any of the views expressed are my own. They ask me to say that each time. 
Um, I'm going to first of all talk a little bit about the view from legal tech suggests three principles to keep in mind when thinking about curriculum design and legal education uh, reform. I'm going to talk about where this might lead, some digital opportunities, and a little bit about implementation, all of which is probably not going to be within six minutes, but I'm going to talk about it. Um, so requirements of, uh, uh, sorry, uh, I skip around. The view from legal tech, view from legal tech. I was at legal tech uh, this last January. Uh, those of you who heard uh, Bill Henderson actually uh, shouted out a little bit about that. Uh, took some students down there. There's 20 to 30 billion dollars of commerce in that room, in that set of rooms. It is very significant activity. Uh, E-discovery is the big one. Uh, I'll just tail off from there. Uh, but but it's 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 in that room, uh, set of rooms. It's it's big. And my insight, uh, which was thanks in part to Professor Anderson uh, chatting with him while we were there, was that this is law practice. It's not ancillary. It's not this funny thing around the edges. This is law practice. This is where it's happening. Uh, firms are no longer the best way to do it, if they ever were. The firms are no longer the best way to do it. We, we could repackage, and, and there was scale, and there was all kinds of things that made a firm a useful economic entity. Basically, outsourcing chunks of that into the cloud, into these other kinds of, of ways of, of delivering, is where we're headed. And it's just, you know, we could get used to it. It's what's happening. It's where we're headed. And we might as well train our students into that. And there are jobs. You heard I took some VLS students down. Uh, they, 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 they got some interviews. They got some jobs. Not everybody, but you know, hey, in this market, if I can get a few, a few students a job, you know, that's a good thing. And 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 there's lots of jobs in there. And there, as you heard from from and Bill Henderson was talking. So what is it, and how do we teach it? First of all, I'm going to step back a little bit, as I do in the, in the paper, and say we ought to remember as we design a curriculum, you know, what, what are we doing? Why are we doing this? What are we doing it for? And I have three principles that I pick out. Um, everybody's got their own list, but mine are these three. First of all, we should be attentive to the fact that there is value added for the student in what we are teaching. If there is not value added in some fashion, and indeed it can be both economic, it can be economic, it can be social, it can be personal, there's a whole domain of values. But if we're not adding value to the student, what are we doing this for? Because why are they paying us and all that? We should also have values added. I think it's good to remember that law is a normative exercise, and that education should reflect that. Because um, that is an important piece of what we do. We should always be putting values into that. And we can argue about what those values are. And my school's version of that may be a little different than your school's, but uh, uh, there we are. I, but I would also rem remind us that effectiveness is not just a, 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 a piece of, 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 of you know, value added. It's also values added. We, the, the, the values of being an effective advocate are, are, are there. So, so we should think of competence as a value as well as, 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 as a piece of values as well as a piece of value. Uh, and it needs to be economically sustainable. What we do and how we do it has to be at a price with, with needs for turn that we can sustain. Uh, and the old model is maxing out if it hasn't already maxed out. I mean, in the sense that the old model in which we sold as law professors portions of our time to our students and kept the rest for ourselves to, to really do cool stuff that we want them to do is, uh, I'm not sure where it is at the moment. Um, I'm, I'm, anyway, so the old model is maxing out on that. And, and I think we need to think about that differently. So back to value added. Uh, traditional expectations. What, a new, what a, uh, a new lawyer needed to know then, i.e., yesterday, um, was uh, I, I, my list again. And yours might be a little different. But bar pass its substance. I mean, again, if you can't uh, uh, pretend that your your law school at least assists in people passing the bar, then, then, then you know I, I think you fail some of the value added tests. Yale Law School, not the sin. <laughs> Friends at Yale. There you are. Uh, so. Uh, another piece of it is arguments about what law is. There's a kind of you know, uh, a language we all share. There's the, the, the club has this kind of language, this argumentation approach. Statutory, case, Langdellian, realist, critical. There's a set of kind of uh, 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 linguistic and argumentative handshakes we expect from each other if we're actually going to practice law in the United States. And, and we need to train people in that. That's, that's the classic first year to some degree. Uh, skills. Skills. Okay, the list now it clearly includes skills. We had that fight, right? That was that you know uh, the crate and Carnegie and all that. We're done with that. I hope at this point we need skills and and uh, that's writing, research, problem solving. Everybody's got again a bit of a list. That's a piece of what they need now. And then I, I would add some perspective. Certainly, this is one of the things we do at, at Vermont Law School. I think most law schools do this and say, yeah, it's not just this. We need to understand policy, some interdisciplinarity, international is big. You know, what, what, what are these the perspectives on all this? We can be reflective lawyers as well as effective lawyers and, and make, make that, that, that a, a possibility. Good, worth improving, fabulous, but simply not enough anymore, I'm arguing. Emerging expectations now. 
all of the above and more. And defining the more is part of our task. Uh, I have a couple cautions. First of all, like my colleague Carl Yurka, and known in librarians for the Yurka question, which is there's too much, too many targets, not enough time. We need to multitask. We need to make cho hard choices. He says, what are we really good at now that we need to stop doing so we can do the next thing we really need to do more of? And that's hard for us because we've been very good at a certain kind of education, and we need to get over the fact that we're going to be sacrificing that. I'll cry. We'll have a great wake. We'll, we'll, we'll toast the past, and we're going to get on and move to the uh, second, the academic specialty trap. What we need to do teach is distinct from what we like to study. And for ac legal academics, this is sometimes hard because we're just, I, you know, I do law and neuroscience. I love law and neuroscience. There is no way that law and neuroscience should be the cornerstone of anybody's curriculum. I'm just <laughs> sorry. Uh, so there we go. Uh, we need to listen intelligently to the marketplace. We need to get over the notion that it's a bad thing to train people for to be effective in a trade. I mean, what a bizarre notion that we as academics claiming to educate people to be lawyers should be should should have this reluctance to, to actually own that as the thing we do. And just, anyway, it's just bizarre to me that, that, that that's a canard rather than a than, than a badge we should wear with honor. So anyway, we need to listen intelligently uh, to the marketplace and not to confuse research value with lawyer value. You know, the things I love to research, great, uh, but not lawyer value. Caution three: the current expertise trap. We need to learn new things. That's hard for professors. We need to learn new things in order to teach new things. So, digital lawyering. Why is it important? Why should this be part of what we're what, what I'm claiming is this is this part of this great sort of renovation and, re and, and uh, renewal that I think we're going to see in, in terms of how we teach law? First of all, it is a new frontier in law, law and lawyer activity. I've got a list here. Most people here are, 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 are reasonably on top of this. Again, I'm, I'm <laughs> preaching to the, to the choir in this, in this uh, exercise. But think about it. Courts and dispute revolution. Evidence, e-discovery, it's, it's all over there. The automation that's going on there is upon us, is happening. We need it. We need to teach it. Law of digital activity. Again, there's, 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 there's the law of digital, well, as well as the digital law, IP, privacy, information policy. Again, uh, the, 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 the national level things we've seen about defense and all that are just an, uh, an example of where, where, where we need lawyers for. Uh, uh, by the way, for job opportunities, if you're not um, 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 uh, concerned about it, is, is that the, the US Army's new uh, 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 cyber command is hiring lawyers. I have noticed one of my students has is, 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 is had a set of interviews with the US Army cyber command for lawyers. So you know, there, there are places out there um, across the spectrum in job opportunities. Uh, uh, government service delivery, uh, automation, we're automating a lot of that. Um, uh, advocacy, Bill McKibben, the great environmentalist in, up in Vermont, is essentially turning away from, from the use of, of direct law as advocacy to, to, to the internet as the basis of advocacy. And indeed, a lot of advocacy campaigns need to be coordinated across law and, and, and other forms of uh, mobilizing people. Analysis, EPA database paired with epidemiology. Again, the big data stuff is, is sitting there and ready to be used by lawyers and in law kinds of circumstances. Client interaction, professional presentation, we see that, again, the, 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 the websites of virtual practice, all that kind of thing. Access to justice, legal service and advice, you've heard a lot about already. Program and platform design and implementation. People need, as, as, as the lawyers move into this, as the law moves into this, we have to have the lawyers move into it as well. Importance continues. Digital jurisprudence, and this is a piece that I think is sometimes a little neglected, uh, but a, a selling point to, to the law faculty, is that in fact, it's, intellectually essential to understand technology, to understand where jurisprudence is headed by this. The Langdellian changes that we live within as we write, right, and we teach within, the, the kind of uh, case analysis and all of that, was essentially technologically grounded. It was cheaper printing met German textual criticism, and that was Langdell. Okay? I know that's a cartoon, but it's a useful cartoon. Uh, 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 and, and essentially, the, the West system, the West system is founded in exactly the same decade that Langdell is, 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 is introducing the case method. Why? Because he can. Because technology made the cases available. So we had a jurisprudence that, that grew into the, the, the space that technology had opened. And I think we're going to find that occurring now. That essentially, this is the Larry Lessig code is code um, uh, 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 insight writ large, is that if you want to do the, the jurisprudence, if you want to do the scholarship of the next uh, 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 few decades, you have to base it in technology in order to be really understanding of where it's all headed. Um, so uh, there's a lovely article out there, have you been Turing, by the way? 
Uh, and that was, uh, it's a short article that basically says that, 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 that uh, activity after activity gets hit by computers, changes, and becomes Turing, as they said. The law is getting Turing, law professing is getting Turing, you gotta do it. We're working on a, then, the, then there's the big project, as far as I'm concerned, which is true computational law. Uh, Dan Katzblog and their other leaders, essentially it's the algebra ana uh, uh, analogy. Um, uh, uh, not to predict, but to create computable language. If we can create the equivalent of algebra for uh, um, uh, the kinds of things that law does, then it will become actually computable and not just described using computers to, to, as a prosthesis for legal activity, but will become the, the, the place in which legal activity takes place. Current work that I'm involved with includes uh, uh, Vermont Law School, but also Harvard, the Berkman Center. Uh, Google has given us a grant. Uh, we're working with the Treasury, uh, working with, with uh, foundations like Grutter and Coffin, working with companies like Exari. There are places to, to do this. There's support out there. I would urge you all to consider. Um, so, uh, importance again, jobs, we've talked about that. Access to justice, you've heard a lot about. Creative destruction. Levitt's great quote, to survive, organizations will have to plot the obsolescence of what now provides their livelihood. Uh, you know, it's just one of those things you have to be engaged in. We, as law schools, need to, need to be involved in the obsolescence. Why? Because if you're not, and my law school is, I, I think we're going to be out there ahead of you. That might be. So what does teaching look like this? Uh, we wanted to cross the curriculum, which is a must. E-courts, evidence, transactions, all of this can be across the curriculum. We have special, uh, clinical is as strong as you've heard, specialty courses, the Yurka question, what are we dropping out? Uh, we've got document assembly, expert systems, data <coughs> discovery, practice management, et cetera, virtual practice. We've got a suite of these that we're implementing at Vermont Law School. We've done one this year, we're doing three next year, we'll do six the year after. We're, 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 we're building into this. I would urge you all to, to, to think about it as well. Uh, degree possibilities, um, a master of legal technology, distance, uh, various activities, app clubs, game design, Placement uh, works well with research and scholarship. Again, that's a possibility. And consulting for students and faculty. Again, by the way, there is consulting available in this for those who would like to, to think about it as an outside source. And so much more. There's other points of innovation and change, uh, new pedagogy, um, uh, uh, new licenses and new degrees. Again, the, 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 the open, open end of this is, is, is vast, and I only um, I hint at it and, and, and urge you to use your imagination in this. So conclusions. I would suggest that as we see this redesign of, of legal education, that we, we start with three principles, value added, values added, and economically sustainable, uh, and that as we go into the reform of curriculum, we think about technology of law as an important piece of the puzzle, an opportunity with a lot of facets, and I thank you. Thank you, Oliver. I know one person in the room has successfully done a six-minute six Ignite uh, presentation. Whether he's going to do that right now, I don't know. But uh, Will Hornsby is going to talk about about gaming. You guys just time me. <laughs> nothing I say should. This is the disclaimer unit. Uh, <laughs> nothing I say should be deemed the policies of the American Bar Association or any constituent entity. <laughs> we have a social uh, compact, obviously, to provide justice for all. That's our responsibility as a profession. When we look at the legal needs studies from the last 20 years, we find that we failed to do that, failed miserably. And the vast majority of people, I shouldn't say the vast majority, the largest um, uh, response is of those people who uh, do nothing when they're faced with a legal problem. And so the conclusion, if we drill down in those studies, the conclusion is that um, people are unaware of when they have a problem that has a legal solution. And that's what we need to focus on, and that's what our technology has failed to focus on. We have turned to advertising in the last 37 years um, as a, a, a method of uh, alerting people. Uh, so when your car is rolled over by a semi, uh, you know that the hammer is there to get you cash. And, and I submit to you that that's not engagement, that's uh, opportunity. Um, and we've also uh, done an extraordinary job of customer service. Uh, we have, there, there's a, a law firm, at least one law firm in New York City, which will send a limo to get you, which will send a uh, van to provide you with the resources um, and, and meet with a lawyer. Um, we've done great outreach work. Um, but that's, uh, that's convenience, that's not engagement. Next. Um, we've, we've used uh, social media uh, effectively uh, for a small demographic. There's about 12% uh, of lawyers are uh, tweeting, about 13% of uh, uh, people in America are tweeting. 
um, and lots of these tweets are far less than relevant to what we need to do <laughs> to engage them. Um, we have a uh, crisis in uh, legal literacy. We constantly see these surveys where 10% of the people in America think they're good marshals, the Chief Justice of the United States. But really, yeah, that'd be great. Um, but, but who cares? Uh, you know, that, that's not going to drive people to lawyers to solve their problems, right? Um, and, and we have a convenient mythology, I believe. Uh, people will argue with me about this, but we have a convenient mythology that legal services are unaffordable. I don't think they're unaffordable for the vast majority of people for the vast majority of legal needs. If you look at half the people, half the adults in America don't have wills, the annual uh, income uh, for a household in America, the average annual income is $50,000 a year. You can get a will for $150 from a lawyer, not from, a, not from LegalZoom, but from a lawyer. Um, you know, that's one third of 1% of uh, your annual income for one year, and you don't need to get it every year. We have prepaid plans, $12 a month. You can get legal services, EAPs for people working that have that as a resource. There are modest means legal lawyer referral services that have um, reduced fees uh, as low as $35 an hour. Um, statewide modest means programs in some states. We have fee shifting uh, for certain uh, uh, legal services, including um, uh, landlord tenant. Um, contingency fees, are you kidding me? You don't have to pay me a dime unless you get something and then I just take part of what you get. And we still don't drive people who have legal rights to lawyers even with the hammer. Um, so, you know, fees are just not an issue there. And marketplace fees are low. Um, if you look, if you spend 20 minutes on a Craigslist looking at legal services, you're gonna see people advertising uh, for rates that are, I think are incredibly low for routine legal services, for those legal services that people want the most. What we have is we have an engagement <coughs> deficit. We fail to drive people to lawyers because they don't know that they have a legal, uh, that they have a problem that has a legal solution. So um, while, I mean, while the words I make, uh, with the words I have here that you might not have seen before, you can at least figure out what they are as opposed to Oliver's words, um, so, uh, <laughs> gamification is just a stupid name for games, playing games, right? How many of you have ever played a game on, uh, on a computer, on the internet, on something? Solitaire, uh, Angry Birds, uh, anything like that. You know, almost everybody. What? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so, it, it, so it's pervasive. People play games all the time, and the, and the, and the great majority of them, like, like the games John always plays, are mindless. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, the legal, the legal profession for, for, uh, you know, for, for over 100 years has been the upper center of pop culture. We have uh, you know, really serious things uh, in TV shows, movies, and, and literature. Um, Judge Judy gets paid over $40 million a year, $800,000 a week to settle barking dog neighbor disputes, right? And people, and she gets paid that because people watch her all day long. And, uh, you know, but we haven't translated this into uh, internet. So what we have are things like quizzes. Well, who will... You know, we of all people should know after taking bar exam, nobody ever wants to take a test, right? Uh, so, you know, but what do we have? Non pro tonk. Uh, uh, what is it? How did you define it? This is an online legal quiz. And then uh, you know, we have some uh, some uh, online teaching <coughs> tools. And to be fair, there are more obviously more sophisticated simulation kinds of uh, materials than this. But we really need to go out and do some other things. You know, why not angry lawyers instead of angry birds? <laughs> 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 In the late 1990s, the uh, United States Army had a crisis in recruiting. They had a problem getting teenage boys to sign up for low-paying jobs where people shot at them. <laughs> I would imagine. Um, so they created, as, as part of the solution to that, an online multiplayer, massive multiplayer online game called America's Army. And uh, you know, this, is, this is what it looks like. No coincidence that it looks like Afghanistan. Um, so. Uh, and it turned out to be a very important tool to their recruitment. Um, it, it
because it had created engagement for their market audience. And they would do collateral things like drive around and head in those cool vans that they have with the camouflage and stuff. And uh, I wonder when you're driving down the road if they really think you can't see them. Anyway, they would have these tournaments and stuff, and, and it became an effective recruiting tool. Uh, there are alternative uh, reality uh, massive multiplayer online games, the, the, one of which I, that I thought was really great is World Without Oil. And, and uh, the sponsors of this spawned uh, an enormous conversation in the community that was involved with it. And it's obviously an environmental uh, type of thing, and, and it's closed down because, it, because the world ended. <laughs> Didn't have any oil, um, but, but but people blogged about it. People who were playing would blog about it, and they would write about it. And there were conversations. There was engagement, uh, and 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 it uh, uh, next one, uh, and, and it, it really had uh, an influence. And so there there are alternative um, reality possibilities for us. What if we had world without ports? Um, you know, people there'd be some players who would be celebrating that. There would be people who would be fighting. There would be people who, you know, people like, what if Donald Trump couldn't get bankrupt three times? I mean, what would his life be now? You know, how would that change? So there's all sorts of possibilities and all sorts of interactions here. And so, um, you know, uh, let's, game of, let's make it by gamification. Um, let, you know, let, let's just do it. I think every every stakeholder has a place here, but I think that the the academy has a special place because there is this latent legal market that we can tap into through enhanced engagement. We can overcome the engagement deficit. And who is that most important for? It is most important for the next generation of lawyers. And we are the people who are responsible not only for educating them, but for giving them a foundation for their life's work. And I think that we can join together, stakeholders can come together in various ways, and the creativity of the people in this room and in, in the academy that can do this. Um, and so it should be a collaborative effort, and um, I think it can be monetized uh, significantly too. And there are a couple people who are, who are working in this direction. Stephanie Cambro is, is, is trying to do this as a, a method of engaging people and bringing them into her estate practice. Lisa Colfoy is at uh, Legal Aid Online is working on this. Um, and I think there's great potential to it. So with that, I think I've concluded my six minutes. I just want to say thank you to Mark and Ron for inviting me and letting me um, you know, have as broad a topic as possible, and Andrew, and um, also, I, I, and, and John, of course, and I also want to give a shout out to the Law Review people who put up with my late uh, submissions and were uh, very helpful in, in uh, crafting uh, my uh, article as well. Thank you. Thank you. And as mentioned, we still have some copies down here in case anyone might want to take home, including Will's article. I think I'll use the virtual clicker like Will did, and that seems to have worked well. <laughs> yeah, thank you. It's kind of weird in this day and age. Use a law degree that I get it. Require a, a, a law student uh, slave to do this work. Um, <laughs> I, I knew it was a mistake to go after Will Hornsby, so I unfortunately Ron got to set it up this way. This is the last segment before a little more conversation. We've, we've all been very excited about the possibilities of expressing legal knowledge in software, of having students build these brilliant applications that we can then deliver to the world. We talked about cognitive prostheses that can capture how lawyers think and enhance our reasoning. And uh, as I mentioned before, there's, there's the awkward question about whether, is this legal? Can we do this? Are there problems? Some people seem to think that uh, putting this kind of stuff out there for others to use is an illegitimate activity. And it crosses the boundary into unauthorized practice of law. So that's what I'm going to talk about for a few minutes. And uh, as one of the co conspirators behind this Law Help Interactive project, which has become the big mothership through which a lot of this content is being delivered, I've got more than an academic interest because I could probably be indicted in about 35 different states if, in fact, this is unauthorized practice, which is a crime in a number of locations. So, um, we, we certainly embrace the idea of professional regulation for all kinds of activities that we engage in, taxi drivers, truck drivers, plumbers, electricians. Why, why should one profession be vulnerable to outsiders coming in and purporting to do what, this, what people like us have been trained to do, to have been spent a lot of time being educated, being credentialed, being licensed, being regulated? Why should a profession have to you know, be subjected 
to this unfair competition. I'm talking, of course, about the teeth whitening industry. <laughs> <laughs> and as, as you may know, in many states right now, uh, there's, there's a big controversy because there are a lot of people opening up shops to do teeth whitening without having any kind of dental credential. And the dentists are up in arms. Like, wait a second, this is, this is what we do. You know, we charge good money for this. And, and this is a very dangerous activity. We might you know, <laughs> really be hurt if their teeth are improperly whitened. Next. There's an interesting uh, study by a libertarian think tank about how the dental industry is thwarting competition. But just as a background to frame, you know, for us lawyers, are we kind of acting the same way as, as the dentists are about, about teeth whiteners? Are the same kind of economics at play, or is there something special about what we do that makes us more or less vulnerable to outside competition? So in my article in the, in the proceedings, <clears throat> I develop a number of scenarios about Sue, Sue Hilfer, okay? Sue is an imaginary personality, but she, she's had a couple semesters of law school under her belt. She went through a bitter divorce, didn't finish law school, never got a law degree, never, never got moved to the bar. But she made it her life's mission to help other people, other women particularly, to, to navigate through the divorce process. And I go through 20 or 30 different ways in which Sue explores, uh, next slide, explores delivering knowledge about, about divorce. Certainly pamphlets and books and radio talks, TV appearances, videotapes. She goes through the entire gamut, the website, interactive software on the desktop, on a website. She goes down to the courthouse and sits in front and helps people. She even got a bunch of seniors together to put together a, a machine based out, based out of a pinball machine and a player piano and an old mechanical printer put it at the courthouse that, that can generate forms for, for people who are going into the courthouse. So Sue's been an activist, and some of us, when we think about the boundaries of law practice, have people like Sue in mind, say, gee, that's the kind of activity we largely want to support. She's doing good things, she's promoting access to justice, she's going to be encouraged and supported, not prosecuted. Other people think about the opposite. We, some folks who are anxious to police the boundaries of law practice are worried about Sites like sueyourneighbor.com. This is imaginary, but probably not too. Uh, right? And these sort of unscrupulous operators who, who are not lawyers, they claim we're not lawyers, we're worse than lawyers. Uh, we, we help you, uh, you know, uh, achieve your rights, generate complaints, give you guidance about how to maximize your recovery and, and you know, get, get revenge on your neighbors. So, depending upon your mindset, which kind of player you have in mind, um, you may have a different basic instinct about whether this stuff is legitimate or not. Now, we're not talking about, for the moment, traditional service, where there's somebody sitting down with somebody, interactively helping them uh, analyze their, their facts or generate documents, or even a co-production scenario where you're dealing with um, unbundled service, where both the, the service provider and the service recipient are, are involved in doing the work. But, but this third form of self-help, which is really situations where somebody with legal knowledge has found a way to embody it in software, in an artifact, put it up in the cloud or elsewhere where others can use it, and there's no contemporaneous relationship between these people. In fact, very often the recipient has no idea who wrote or created the thing they're using, right? And nor does the creator know who's using it or when they're using it, so there's kind of a separation. Does that make a difference in terms of how you characterize this? So this is actually a, a surprisingly complex topic that I, I, there's a lot of muddle-headed thinking about, I've discovered as I've read through cases and, and law review literature and, and general discussions about it. And I think the, the fundamental source of that is that we have two contrary propositions that we respond to. The first is that, gee, if there's something you can't do in person, why should you be able to create a program to do it? Isn't that kind of just as bad? And, that, and you see some judges talking about it. Well, there's a, there was some human behind this piece of software. It didn't come out of the blue. So you can't disclaim responsibility for this product of your imagination. It's you acting through software. And if you can't do it yourself directly, doing it through software should be no, no more permissible. That's one attitude. The second is that, on the other hand, if it's something you could write about, if you could describe this in a book, or a set of charts or outlines or, or you know, figures and, and pictures to explain to somebody how to do it. Why can't you do that in software? I mean, books are free. 
right? We should have some freedom of expression. And we're torn between these two poles, these two contrary propositions, that pull us in different directions. So a lot of people think about it, well, software is just a book. Some of us, including me, many, for many years said, well, it's, it's just a different, it's kind of a fancy book, right? It's text. It's uh, text that emits text. It's incapable of judgment. It's really something that's, as I said, mutually anonymous, typically. You've got this sense that the program gives the same results to everybody at the same time. Uh, but what's different is it can be contextualized. So it can be dynamic. As somebody uses the program, it can ask questions, and it can respond. It can branch, and it starts to feel like, well, this is a little more than a simple book. And especially nowadays with advanced interfaces, and as, as John said, with Siri and, and Watson and other, other technologies of increasing intelligence, these things are going to start feeling very human-like and very unlike books. So, and, and the, the vendors of them describe them as expert systems and uh, artificial intelligences, etc. So, again, the old debate, in, in some ways the easy debate is, Here's a, here's a typical book in New York, you know, uh, Norman, Norman Daisy's How to Avoid Probate, famous case. The New York Bar Association tried to shut it down because he was giving away the secrets to how, to how to actually escape the probate process. And it went up to the, I guess, to the highest court, to the Supreme Court or the Court of Appeals in New York, and determined to be, uh, you know, this is free expression. This is protected by the First Amendment. This is something you're unable to do. It's a book, you know. And so law is not being practiced, at least not in a way that anybody can, can prevent. Next slide. Question is, when you're creating software, is there, is there a significant difference? Does software somehow take you out of the realm of, of freedom of the press? So I, I, in my article, I've got a number of kind of uh, frames to which to think about this. This is not in the article, but you might find it useful, which is, we think of where these various forms of helping people, of delivering things that are useful to someone who <coughs> needs to do work in their lives. You've got some that are in the nature of human services, and some that are in the nature of producing an artifact or a work of authorship, right? Some have physical effects, like power tools or medical devices, and some have informational effects. And the question is, programs, do they belong squarely back in this quadrant where it's really like a book or a pamphlet? Or is the fact that a program can produce effects, legal documents, legal relationships, and other things that can have significant impact on your life, does that take you more into the physical realm? Does that justify some regulation? Just a, a preliminary thought there. In the paper, next slide, I developed two, two uh, pictures. One is just to understand the different modes of expression. And the basic branch is between performances, which are things where, you're, where you, as a human, are engaging in communicative, communicative activity, either one-on-one -on -one or publicly. And then there are and works of authorship, uh, traditionally books and pamphlets and other kinds of writings, but increasingly dynamic programmable material. And I think there's a very fundamental difference as far as how the law should treat it between the performances and the artifacts. Next slide. And this kind of captures the essence, which is the program more like a book, which should deserve protection, or is it more like a, a service that we think might legitimately be relegated to licensed professionals. And the trick is that it, it has aspects of both, right? It's a, a tertium quid, but it's got relationships to these others. So like a book, a program is written in advance, it's canned. Once it's created, it doesn't change uh, upon its being used. It is highly textual, as after all, a program is, is text and numbers and producing various kinds of text. It's, it's a work of authorship. But the service is bi-directional, it's dynamic, it's interactive. In, in, in the kind of applications we're building in these courses, it's generative, it's producing stuff. So it's like, wait, I can, I can see how it can be, it can have the attributes of, of a service and therefore maybe be subject to regulation. Next slide. So in the article, I, I try to make the claim that there are a lot of things that should not make a difference. And there's actually decent case law on most of these individuals. <coughs> So the fact that you're doing something electronically doesn't change the essential character. The fact that it's online, the fact that it might be asynchronous or synchronous, how, how the interaction happens shouldn't make a difference. The fact that there's an interactivity and navigability inside of an application, we can jump around hyperlinks and answer questions and be taken down tasks, 
in theory, that could be constructed in a book of arbitrary size. You could have a book that had every, every one of 10,000 possible permutations of the fact pattern in the, in, the, in the associated forms. Whether it's phrased in terms of advice or not, just the fact that someone says, I would recommend, or for someone in your situation, my advice is, if that's in a book, no one would claim that's unauthorized practice of law. But somehow, when, when it's being done online, people feel like that's closer to the human interaction. There's, there's no distinction between free or paid. We can't take refuge and say, hey, all the good guys in the nonprofit world, we can do this, but those bad players that are out there taking away lawyers' lunches and, and doing arguably unscrutable behavior. When it comes to prior restraint in the First Amendment and freedom of expression, we don't make those kinds of distinctions, right? And under recent Supreme Court jurisprudence, corporations have that every much right as, as individuals have when it comes to, to freedom of expression. So in conclusion, the premise is, are we, are we free to code the law? And, and my instinct for law has always been yes, but after doing more writing and thinking, I'm more convinced than ever, I'm not sure I'm right, but I think there's a, a very strong case. So quickly here, crafting tools that helps self-helpers to <coughs> Understand the legal rights and obligations and accomplish legal work it is a form of free, of free expression. It doesn't need to be authorized. Freedom of expression, by definition, should not require anyone's authority, even if someone calls it the practice of law. So, the question of whether something is the practice of law to me is somewhat irrelevant. You can call it that, it doesn't make it the practice of law. If even more importantly, it doesn't make it expression that is uh, amenable to being. We have at least 10 minutes for interaction and, and questions or reactions. Uh, we thank you for your attention so far. And what's a, what does occur to you? I, I was struck. Hang on one second. Let's get you a mic so we can. Mic. Those that may be watching this on a webcast will hear you. I'm Frank Snyder from Texas Wesley. Um, what I was struck by your, your comments was that uh, I think that the <coughs> distinction that you're drawing between service and artifact is one that changes a lot over time. Mm. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with work with Clayton Christensen. Sure. Uh, but things which once were extremely complex professional services are now pills, which can be purchased in a drugstore. Mm -hmm. uh, and many of the things in my field, business organizations, for example, uh, in 1870, to form a corporation, you went to Sullivan and Cromwell uh, and they drew up a bunch of documents and they brought it through the whole system and they crafted all kinds of agreements. Now you go online uh, on a state website, punch in a few issues, enter your credit card, and you got a corporation. So I think that that distinction over the long term is going to be kind of difficult to maintain, although I think that in the modern, uh, uh, our current situation, I think it has some, uh, some resonance with a lot of people. But, I think that a lot of what this conference seems to me to be driving toward is more a commoditization and a an artifactation, uh, to make up another word, of, of law practice. Any reaction? Bob, or any reaction to that? That basic notion of, of law moving in the, in the direction of more and more intelligent and interactive aspects of the system being deployed in our country. Uh, yeah, and that's a good thing. That's a good thing. It's a very good thing. I mean, the idea that law is to be sort of a, on a case-by-case -case basis and that each, oh, sorry. Uh, I said it was a very good thing. Uh, the idea that law has to be done on a case-by-case -case basis which sort of comes out of a particular tradition of professions that we think of in the early 20th century as also tied to the adversary ethics. It's not, it's not nature. It's not what law has to be. And actually, if you think about law for three seconds, there's a lot of law that everyone knows that isn't about uh, creating little difference and, and complexity. And so it seems like if we recognize that law, underlying law, is systems and think of that as commoditized, that's good, not a bad thing. Okay. I think there's, it sort of identifies one other prime value of courses like this, which is it, it sensitizes law students to the fact that lots of what they lawyers historically have done can now, in fact, be done quite effectively by machines. 
I, I would take it even a step further. There's a lovely short article out there that you can Google because I don't recall the, the, the citation exactly, but the title is something like, Have You Been Turing? You know, Turing, the, the developer, one of the developers of modern computer. And this article basically says that field after field, essentially, as, as the things that that field is involved become computational, become, you know, goes through a massive restructuring and becomes this other thing. Uh, so, so part of it is, have we been Turing? Well, I think we're in the middle of being Turing. But the other step of that is that also I would urge us to think that that thing, that set of solutions and processes that we have called, called law do not exist because uh, I don't know, uh, somebody with, a, with a, the, 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 the big finger came down and touched, touched somebody in a three-piece suit. It exists because um, uh, there are human problems of, of interaction and structure that, that needed solutions, and we came up with this system that we broadly call law as a way to deal with those. I would urge us also to imagine that we will find that, that they can be dealt with in ways that we would not call law. And that, that in fact, the, the, the whole thing we call law is, is, is subject to, 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 to restructuring and restructuring ways so that we can figure out a way to migrate the things we have done in the law into being done in other ways. You know, if, if they're cheaper, more effective, why not? That would be a good thing. John Mayer, John Mayer uh, Kelly, quick comment. So um, apparently, in the future, Google's driverless cars will be better drivers than all of us because they're not distracted, they're uh, not uh, sending texts while they're driving, they don't get drunk, things like that. And so, um, so we'll want them to drive our cars, or at least the insurance companies will. As a matter of fact, maybe it will cost you more if you don't have a driverless car because you are a distractible human being. Are we going to be building systems that are better lawyers in certain situations than, than lawyers are because they can make mistakes, they can forget things, they miss deadlines? You know, the software won't. There's an old expression that you heard back in the 70s and 80s when people began <coughs> talking about automation and law that uh, people, people would ask, are lawyers going to be replaced by computers? And, and, the, and the best answer has always been to me, the lawyers who can use computers effectively will replace the lawyers who can't. So it's not an either or, it's both and, of course. And, but I think increasingly, our, the, the rise of, of, of non-biological intelligence, frankly, is the most significant development of our coming century. It's going to transform law in all its guises, and we're just at the beginning of the process. You don't have to go much much farther than checklists to deal with. I mean, the whole checklist phenomenon. And there's literature about this in the medical profession. Um, I mean, you don't have to have a you don't have to Turing eyes us. You just have to have a checklist that says you ought to check all these things before you execute this document or sign this contract or or, 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 or um, enter into this into this deal. And, and that's enough, right, to justify the, the, the systematization that we're talking about and makes the, that increases the quality and, and so on. And the other question, I mean, I've, think, I've been thinking about this, that question about are we going to take, make, make lawyers go away or automate lawyers? And, and my answer has always been that if you can, we must. Right? We're almost ethically required to do that. Because if you can make a, a, a machine, or a pill, or whatever it is, that does a better job and can do this le legal work better than we can, right. that, then we are probably ethically required to do that. That's <laughs> 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 good, we have a couple of hands. Drop that um, I actually wanted to push you a little bit, Mark, on yes. this issue <laughs> of uh, unauthorized practice. And I, I've been very, I mean, I've been sort of going around and around about it uh, for a while, and I'm completely sympathetic with our, all of our shared instincts, or maybe not all of them, many of our shared instincts, that this is about uh, uh, freedom of speech, et cetera. But what I think that the focus is in terms of the cases and the categories is that what gets, what gets missed is a system of, if you think about what, uh, the, what uh, being a professional is, is that you can be sued for malpractice. And so there's a safety net in terms of the negligence system. That's true of doctors, that's true of lawyers, et cetera. And uh, what the, the, the question that leaves open is, if someone is harmed, what is there to help them? I'm, here's an analogy. Excel spreadsheet, I'm sure all of you read, was the cause of the financial crisis. Surprise, <laughs> right? I mean, there was a mistake. There's a, a flaw in it, and I can't remember the details, but um, uh, that's, you know, we, no, we, we're not selling, we're not suing uh, Microsoft for, right? There's no redress. So uh, it seems to me that this is a space where we might want to think a little bit about 
the harms that are out there that would hurt people using it. And and I know, and, and a number of you know that you know Stephanie Kimball is involved in some efforts to um, to find certifications and best practices and sort of create uh, a, a institutional presence so that people can tell who's good at this and who isn't. But I think we need to think a little bit more about that. Yeah, I, I agree. There's, there's there's no question that there's bound to be struck. There are significant dangers and, and harms potentially afoot, and we need to think of a way to, to adjust them. But again, we're talking about the transition of knowledge and, and expression. And we, we allow books to be written about eating dangerous mushrooms and, and do, doing all kinds of other things. And we just need to be careful as legal professionals that we don't let somehow our self-interest and our, our sense of paternalism uh, with respect to the public override our, our, our values about the, the importance of freedom, freedom of expression and exchange. And I think in the long term, a, a robust marketplace of these kinds of tools coming forth is probably the best way to achieve the most good. But it's, that's the public policy question. Yes, the constitutional question is tougher. And uh, anyway, I'm sorry. I'm Mark Lesnar Fines, University of Virginia City. Um, as I think, especially about the gamification aspect of this, I'm thinking about all the different things that lawyers do, the roles that they play, and those that are pretty easy to translate into technology, and those that give me some misgivings. And, I, and the gamification presentation in particular caused a kind of a, 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 I love games. I love this. I would love to spend my entire life doing nothing but writing games about law. But it makes me feel a little uncomfortable that I'm doing something wrong when I do that. And I was trying to figure out what it was. And I think I have uh, some beginning thoughts about it. Much of what we've seen about when we are using the law, technology, to transfer, translate law, our planning, the lawyer as planner, uh, the lawyer as compliance, helping people comply, helping people plan, uh, but less so helping people protect and uh, helping people resolve. So um, when, when people are in conflict, in order for law to be seen as having the authority, having both the power and the authority to resolve that conflict, they have to accept that both the rules and the decision maker are legitimate. And, and there's a human process in there. Now, whether computers will be seen as more or less legitimate, as more or less agents of the rule of law so that people will internalize that decision making as authority and thus cause them to moderate their behavior in situations of conflict, I don't know. That's kind of the open question to me. But the gamification is what where, where my thought on this all kind of started because I thought, wow, I don't want to drive more people to think that law is a game, that you play for winning. You know, it's, it's sort of like that big lottery <coughs> ticket in the sky. I've been looking for a good lawsuit. <coughs> my God, I finally found one and I'm gonna make my millions. I, I don't want more of that because I think that undermines the rule, the acceptance of the rule of law. But it's okay with war? No, I know, I know. I went there too. I went there too. And, and, and no, I don't think it's okay with war either, but I'm a pacifist. So what the heck am I doing being a lawyer? I don't know. But those were just some thoughts to kind of toss in a, a, another uh, I know Oliver has got at least a response and maybe Will does as well. My response isn't to the game side, which I'll absolutely will, but was was to your assertion that, that dispute resolution is inherently human driven. The online dispute resolution folks um, uh, with things like the, the um, um, uh, uh, PayPal and, and other, other, other dispute resolutions are getting to, to, to success rates of amicable dispute resolution between 60 and 80 percent before a human intervenes. And the, what, the, what, they've, they've, what they've, they've done is they've systematized the kinds of questions a good mediator would ask in order to get the issues in front of people to assist them actually in solving their own dilemmas and, and, and taking them through that piece. Now, is there the residual? Absolutely. Do we need the, the, the folks you're talking about? Absolutely. But I wouldn't necessarily assume 
that, 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 that disputes are also unamenable to these kinds of processes. It's already happening. It's happening with high degree of success. And we're only you know, 10 years in, into, into thinking about it. So I, I would, 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 would say that, that all domains that lawyers and law have traditionally inhabited are subject to uh, 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 automation in some way. We need to wrap up the chapter one, but I thought I'd give Will Hornsby the last word if he would like it. Oh, I'd just say that uh, uh, what we're balancing here is the, the incredible volume of people who don't recognize that they have a legal solution to their problem, don't turn to the system, turn to alternative, sometimes violence, compared to the prospect of uh, other people uh, of, you know, learning that there's an avenue where they might be able to abuse the system, and then maybe our responsibility is to build in safeguards for that not to happen. I'll arrest for one last word. So one, one last word, by the way. Those of you who are in, um, interested in writing in this area, as I um, urge, um, um, my Vermont Law School colleague Rebecca Purdom and I are editors of the new journal Innovation in Legal Education on SSRN. Uh, we would welcome submissions. Uh, please, please, if you submit to SSRN, make sure you, uh, in this field you think about us and check the box for, for innovation in legal education. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> so that ends the symposium. If you saw something today that you think, wow, I wish some of my colleagues would walk, could have been there, they can be. They are literally on YouTube right now, and you can send the links to people and say, you should watch this. You will be as inspired, at least inspired, as I would today. I learned an enormous amount from these folks. And so, uh, so spread the word, use your social media, and or, okay, uh, use email. <laughs>